Welcome to the Scottish Property Podcast. This is a show where we aim to educate, inspire and entertain through real life stories and interviews from people in the Scottish property community. As always, thanks for listening and give us a follow on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Remember to join us at our monthly networking events on the first Wednesday of every month. Tickets are available on our website. So without further ado, we'll just cut straight into this week's podcast. So I am delighted to welcome John McGlynn to the Scottish Property Podcast. Thank you for joining us, John. How are you today? Very well. Delighted to be here, guys. Delighted. Where's, where is the office today then? Because I follow you on Instagram, John, and you've got some life, some globe-trotting lifestyle. Every time I see an Instagram post from you, you're either sitting at the side of a ski resort or you're in some sunny place around the world. So where are you today? Uh, trust me, when you do the number of flights that I do in a year, it ain't as glamorous as it looks. Don't believe everything you see on Instagram. It's great when you post the picture, but the pain of actually getting there through security, through passport control, it ain't all it's cracked up to be. Uh, today, I'm in sunny Monaco, um, which is home. Lovely. I just want to, obviously, from the listeners that don't know you, John, obviously, all you need to do is drive about, you know, if you're in Scotland and you'll see all the, uh, basically, Coval, uh, it's very kind of unique branding, sort of bright yellow and grey uh, and storage vault. So John is the owner of, of that business and it's it's brilliant to have him on here because he's got a wealth of experience in commercial property investing is what we're going to focus on today. A lot of our listeners are residential, but they are looking at, at commercial because maybe for you know, whatever reason, especially with interest rates the way they are, they're maybe not cash flowing as well on their buy to lets and they're looking at other strategies. So it's great to have you on here, John. Can you just take us back to those early days? I think the first uh, commercial property business you had was car parks, was it? So uh, can you just tell us about the first venture? Yeah, that's a, that's a major rewind. So I um, incorporated my first company on the 23rd of December, 1993. 20 years old in the law school library. And um, that was a business called Airlink Security Park Limited, which is our first car park site for Glasgow Airport. And we just really focused on that business. I was green, naive, basically a student at university. And uh, the business took off mainly because, you know, th these are the days when Richard Branson was doing all these crazy stunts. And I thought, on a micro local level, how can we do that kind of thing? And People might remember a TV show called Scottish Passport, yeah. Katie Wood and Brian Burnett. Now, I used to do a show on STV called Trial by Night with Bernard Ponsonby, who's still a good friend to this day. And they used to do this crazy, get argumentative, snotty little law students along to, to the studios and give them a glass of wine and get them on the telly. And one night we did that show, and it was a, a really good one. And I said to Bernard Ponsonby, Bernard, you must know Katie Wood. He went, yeah, why do you want to speak to her? I said, can you put me in touch? So Bernard put me in touch with Katie Wood. They came down, did a, a feature on the, this new innovative car park business. And the following week, I can't remember how we got in touch with Kirsty Wark, but someone got in touch with Kirsty Wark, and it was a show called Upfront. So within two weeks, we ended up on primetime STV and primetime BBC, uh, and that was a huge, you know, catapult for us getting up to the next level. But every time, my, my philosophy was car parks were a cash flow machine, right? And whether you're in residential property, commercial property, or any business, you know, you can lose money from time to time, but if you run out of cash, you're finished. So I've been very, very focused on cash flow, absolutely. And whenever we made profits in the car park business, I always wanted to roll that money over into land and buildings because my dad used to always teach me, you know, they ain't making any more of it. So that was our strategy, very clearly defined, which we've been doing now for 30 years. I can't believe it. I know people wouldn't believe that I'm old enough to be doing this for 30 years, but uh, we are. But that was, we had a very clear strategy from 30 years ago. And I can honestly tell you the strategy that I had age 20 hasn't changed in big, high-level thinking, it hasn't changed. We're in the annuity business. And if you're in the property game, you're in the annuity business. I've got, I've still own many assets today that I bought 95, 96, 97. You know, we've had these assets for a long, long time. Uh, and I still believe in them today as much as the day I bought them. What, what was the, the thinking, John, behind going into car parks rather than starting off smaller and and a residential buy-to-lets and stuff that would have been the more 
I suppose, a low-hanging fruit at the time. Purely accidental. Um, I had friends who used to work at NCP at Glasgow Airport and we were all students. And I used to go down and, and chat to them about, you know, this is when mobile phones were just about taken off, but they were like a pound a minute to use them. So you had one, but you didn't use it, which was weird. Um, so I used to go down to Glasgow Airport to NCP and speak to friends down there. And then I'm like, they're getting paid to sit here and I'm not. I should get a student job here. And you're sitting in the car park booth and you see all the cars going in and out. And if you had an accounts degree, I was doing a law degree. And, you know, you just think, how many cars at that price? And we saw the little airport park and ride buses going past. And I'm counting the passengers going, that's a damn good business. And went off as a 20-year-old student to go, I'm going to go and set one of these up. So it was completely opportunistic, right place, right time. Saw the opportunity, did the P&L in my head. Uh, and worked out what the legals might be. So, yeah. Did you have that entrepreneurial spirit from a a very young age, John? Sorry? Did you have that entrepreneurial spirit from a very young age then to to look at the opportunities and everything you saw? Yeah, I mean, I I come from a pretty entrepreneurial family. My grandfather was a a bookmaker years ago, and my father was in the motor trade all his life. Again, he was one of these guys who only ever had one job as an apprentice and then set up on his own. So the whole journey to self-employment as it was called then we call it entrepreneurship today but it's basically self-employed that to me was just the most normal thing in the world Um, and you see the good times and you see the bad times and you think well you know you can play it safe and go and be a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or whatever or you can uh, you can roll the dice and see where they land and seeing those early days john i mean obviously you've you've expanded hugely now and you've got the full team behind you and all the rest of it but Talk to us about those early days, you know, starting out in business, you know, how hands-on do you need to be? How hard-working do you need to be? How many hours do you need to put into your day? This is at the same time as you're, uh, you know, studying a law degree as well, isn't it? So, like, what yeah. did your kind of, what did your day look like back then? Just so that people can appreciate the hard work involved. If I tell you the truth, your listeners won't believe me. It's as simple as that. People who know me well and knew me back then will testify that this is true. I was literally doing 18-hour days, seven days a week, for months and months and months at a time. Um, even when I was still living at my parents' house, I would literally drive one of the minibuses up to their house, up to the house, and you literally kick your shoes off and lie on top of the bed with your shirt and tie and everything on so that when the phone went and somebody from Aberdeen who was due in at 6 o'clock turned up at 4 o'clock, you quickly jump the bus and go down and take them to the airport because we live quite close to it. And it was that kind of crazy existence where you don't even think about it. You just do what you have to do because there isn't a plan B. If you plan, see these businesses, plan B you see, go back to plan A and make it make it happen. I mean, this is it because you see these business seminars and people are want everyone wants to be an entrepreneur now, right? And you see these business people that are doing courses and all this that they say, you need to be the conductor of the orchestra and have the team in place. And you can just sit back and make sure everyone's ticking along nicely. But in reality, it just doesn't happen like that. I'm at the moment at an early point in my business where I'm like you. I'm I'm doing 16 hours a day. People need to realize it's hard work. Yeah, I mean, I think the the one the one thing that, you know, a lot of people don't realize is until you've actually done it, you don't realize just how intensive it is. And I think the difference between people always say to me, you know, what's the difference between those who 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 win and those who fail? Those who fail, not all the time, but quite often, they just don't want it badly enough. They want the easy path and they want all the trappings of success, but they want to miss out the big chunk in the middle called this is the bit where you did all the hard work. You know, uh, and people think, you know, you, you start a business, uh, you know, you lose 10 grand in the first year, break even in the second and sell out for 20 million in the third. You know, it just doesn't happen like that in the real world. Well, you've never, I think, listen to previous podcasts that you've done, you've never really had that kind of, you know, a lot of people start business to eventually exit and sell up. You've always just wanted to build the assets. So, you know, over that time, that 30 years, you must have built a few assets now. Can you give us any top level figures of like the number of units? I know you're not going to share a lot, but to give us to give the we're listeners the, an idea of the kind of growth and expansion. We're in the annuity business. So to, to give an example, I started the car park business and we had 500 spaces. 
Um, we built that business up to it was something like 14,000 spaces. I actually had more spaces than Glasgow Airport had. And we had some painful times with them, but they they ended up being a really amazing strategic partner to have. It got to we we reached a tipping point and they realized, you know, you're actually servicing our customers and it's in all of our interests to work together, improve quality, improve service. So instead of us fighting about how much I was going to have to pay them for a bus stop, they would basically say, look, why don't you go and have that prime spot and park there? Because we want your customers, our customers to be happy. And I think Glasgow Airport and I flipped the whole model from being really aggressively competitive to saying, look, we're complementary. The customer who wants to park in the multi-storey right at the front door ain't the customer who's going to park three or four miles away. Uh, and we really turned a... a, a a delicate situation into a really good working partnership. And I still work with Glasgow Airport today. I mean, I sold the parking business 10 years ago. And to this day, I'm still one of Glasgow Airport's business ambassadors. I still give them feedback and good practice that I see around the world at airports. I'm probably on the phone with our commercial team on average once a month, once every couple of months, just going, what's happening? Do you need any help with anything? And by the way, I saw this at Geneva Airport. I saw this at you know, Stockholm Airport, and you should maybe have a think about it. And the, the worst decision that Glasgow Airport ever made was to get rid of the Greggs inside the airport terminal building. That was. A... I will. I will raise that with them on my next call. Let's bring back Greggs to Glasgow. I can get behind that campaign. But just <laughs> to take another point, basically, our strategy from day one was make make profits from the car park business and roll that over into commercial property. So, I mean, today our portfolio runs to, you know, millions of square feet uh, on various sites, whether it's, we've got three kind of distinct divisions now. We've got the, the storage vault portfolio, the co-vault portfolio, and the everything else portfolio. Uh, and the everything else is just sites that don't quite fit the storage vault or the co-vault model. Um, so, yeah, we've got literally... And is, know, is that UK wide, or is that have you got sites like? No, ma all? mainly mainly that though the property business at the moment is 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 all really in Scotland, uh, and obviously the next phase for us will be to take take our portfolio, um, you know, a bit wider. Okay, and can you give us any idea how many units, or in terms of? Oh, it's. Like Thousands. I mean, thousands, yeah, yeah. thousands of units. I mean, um, I'm just trying to think if I if I take, you know, one storage vault site could have four or five hundred units. All oh, right. OK, so uh, within within the one building, you've yeah, got to take a number of units. I mean, to give you, to give you, to give you like... a sense of the scale, storage vault portfolio ranges from net rental 20,000 to 180,000. So you know, can you give us an idea of like how the process works in terms of like do you purchase the land, the site, and then develop the building own and own the full asset, or how does it? Or do you yeah, we're, it? We're, we're we're an annuity, so we're freehold. Everything we own is freehold. Um, we we don't do leasehold just because, frankly, I don't understand it. It's too complicated. It's you know, if you can buy a freehold site, why would you buy a leasehold one? It's just another layer of complication. Um. But yeah, everything we everything we have is freehold. We are effectively like a private pension fund. We're an annuity. That's our purpose in life is to say, you know, I mean, people used to say to me in the car parking days, oh, there's this site up at the Clyde side and, you know, you get a really good turn out of that. You can do this. And I say, well, whoa, stop. It's a five-year lease. I never own the asset. I need to improve the asset. The time and effort for me to secure that five-year opportunity I could deploy into a freehold opportunity and we've got the revenue and we, you know the visibility of earnings as far as you can see into the future. So and is, is that what Scottish capital is then? Does that sit at the top and that's the investment kind of fund, if you like? That's where you get your investment for all your, your sites and your assets. Uh, there is no one for the investment is me. I mean, we're I'm you know, I'm the only all right. funder of the owner funder of the business. We don't take in outside capital at all. Um, Scottish Capital is really just a brand that it's the name that owns the names. Okay. You know? Right, okay. So just just through years, and this is what's so interesting, through 30 years of investing and accumulating assets and wealth, you can 
expand at this rate now because you've got that capital behind you without having to raise any external funding. I mean, it's called, uh, you, you know, go and Google the seventh wonder of the world, compound interest, right? I mean, I literally started the entire business with 10,000 quid on my 21st birthday. And if you're just if you're just smart about redeploying capital, you know, and uh, I mean we did a lot of financial engineering when interest rates were you know the square root of nothing. You go and secure, you know, some bank funding at really good deals, and you you do some clever financial engineering. But uh, yeah, I mean, I if you can avoid having investors and 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 partners, then that's a hundred percent the way to go. If you can, not not everyone can do that, but it's the in terms of commercial property, that's the description of Nirvana. How important were these relationships to you, John uh, Groen? You were mentioning a lot about uh, Glasgow Airport relationship. Was these were these pivotal for you to grow the business? Yeah, I mean, like, listen, it's like everything else, right? If you have a if you have a, an acrimonious relationship with somebody, and we did with Glasgow Airport, I make no apologies about it. We went through a phase in the early days where everyone's at loggerheads and it zaps so much time and energy. And actually, the guy who brought it to a head was the current MD of Edinburgh Airport, Gordon Dewar. Um, I was actually with Gordon just at the weekend there, and we were laughing about it. And he basically took over as a new MD and phoned up and said, right, I need to come and see you. I've been, what, you're coming to see me? I'm not being summoned down to the airport. No, no, I'll be up in 10 minutes. He said, right, what's the problem? I said, well, this, this, and this. That's easy. We can solve that. What's next? And Gordon knew exactly what he was doing because he's a sharp, smart negotiator. Uh, and he pressed the big reset button in the relationship, and we were all one team looking after the customers. Uh, and, and, you know, collaboration, you shouldn't look at your competitors as competitors. I mean, I spend my life now going around the, the storage conferences around the world, and there's people who are technically competitors, but but they're not really, because it's a very localised market. And the sharing of information and experiences and what you can learn, you know, if you can be friendly with people, then it's definitely the way to do it. Well, it's, 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 got, it's got a great network we, anyway, because they talk about your network as your net worth, and he was hanging out with TV stars like Bernard Ponsonby. So, do you know what I mean? That was uh, speaks volumes. <laughs> it's it's interesting to see that, John, because we, uh, you know, we always struggle to get not not to sound derogatory, the older school investors that have grew up a huge amount of success because they don't need to give back and they don't need to be out there promoting themselves, coming on podcasts like this. So we always find that quite difficult. So it's quite refreshing to see you saying, well, yeah, I'm happy to share the information and share the knowledge and, and learn the lessons and continue to grow because it's always quite a, a closed off mindset and everyone thinks of competition and collaboration. Look for people who used to be members of the Entrepreneurial Exchange. When I joined that in 1999 and that, that organisation is probably the one that's had the biggest impact on my personal development uh, ever because you, you rock up there with people who you regarded as the, the superstars of the, the business world. Uh, and the mantra was really simple, work hard, play hard, give something back. And that was indoctrinated into us from 1999. Uh, and I still live by those words today. Steve, Stephen was asking earlier on if you can get us in with uh, Duncan Baratine. I'm actually having lunch with Duncan on Thursday this week. Great stuff. Go ahead. Warm introduction, please. That would be the... Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not sure he, I'm not sure he does podcasts and things, but I'm having lunch with him on Thursday, so I'll certainly mention it to him. Great stuff. We will, we will fly out to, to see him and interview him in person. When did the penny drop or the light bulb go off, John, with the uh, co-working space? And, you know, I know there are two different things, but the self-storage and the co-working space, which is obviously now the, kind of the core of your business, I think you've said in the past. So... You know, was it through traveling around, seeing something? When was it that, that, can you remember one moment or did it just kind of evolve? I remember exactly when it was. And Covalt, of all the brands that we have or we've been involved in, that's the one that I'm most proud of. Okay. And and when was that moment then that you thought this could really be something? Oh, wait for it. It's the one brand that I have had nothing whatsoever to do with. That's one that was ambushed upon me when I get back into the office one day. Uh, and it, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think my recollection is it was when we bought our big giant mega site in Canvas Lang and we opened up Storage Vault there. The, the property business didn't have a brand. 
and we'd branded the site as Storage Vault. And I think there was a few commercial customers who were pretty big, chunky businesses who just didn't like the perception that they might be operating out of a self-storage facility. Now, smartest people in the industry operate from flexible storage facilities, but the team went away and said, look, we really need to come up with a secondary brand here. And they went away, got the designs done, they did the brand and basically delivered a fait accompli where it was like, this is what we're doing. Excellent. So 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 you can't take any credit for this. <laughs> I, honestly, I've I mean that that well, the credit I'll take is my job was to get the right team in place in the office. And you know, you really want a bunch of people who every single person is better at what they do than you are. I, I'm really interested in this uh co-working uh, environment and you know, like as some people call it the CMO. Uh, well, just to be just to be clear, we don't really do co-working at all, right? So Covalt uh, is workspace, but it's not really. It's not like we work. You know, we don't. We've got one building in Glasgow down in Cook Street, um, but even that's not co-working in the way that we work. Is it's small, yeah. small office units with uh, a common space, right? But okay. We, you can't come to us and, you know, I think Jerry does the kind of proper co-working where you can literally buy a membership just to walk into the building and use the coffee machine and the desks and things. We've never been in that business. And I think it's, for me, it's a, it's just a subsector of the industry that it's just not for me. Okay, so, so obviously people are obviously venting out of space and having a closed door, but then shared facilities. Yes, Stephen, it's known uh, amongst our circle as CMO as well, isn't it? Is that the same thing? Yeah, commercial multiple occupancy. Yeah. Well, commercial. CMO, CMOs could be anything, right? CMO could be you go and buy a 10,000 square foot warehouse building and you chop it into 10, 1,000 square foot units. Uh, and that would be deemed CMO, you know, commercial multiple occupancy. But it kind of is and it isn't because if you've got 10 individual units, it's not really a CMO per se, but I think Jerry and others use that description so that people understand yeah. the terms. Model, yeah. But, uh, you know, I just, the WeWork model just was one that, you know, we predicted that the business would fail when it okay. opened. And, it, and it, it, it did fail, didn't it? <laughs> in, in Very much. I mean, the, the rent to rent model for me was just always a disaster because the, the property is not a tech business. It's a bricks and mortar business. And, you know, not everybody would agree with me, but I just look at the property sector and say, this is a, a real estate annuity revenue play. I mean, we look at a building and if I don't think we're going to own it for 25 years, we just don't buy it. We're not in the business. At all. I know people who made shed loads of money saying we're going to buy this portfolio, we're going to turn it around and we're going to exit like a private equity fund five, seven, ten years I can honestly tell you we've never bought one site in 30 years and said, this has got a lifespan for a flip. We look at it and say, is this a 25-year play at least? And you've got to remember, I started this business at 20. So I'm looking at 25 years, takes you to 45. Mm -hmm. People are just yeah. getting into business at 45. So, you know, a double play takes me to 70, which is when people might think about retiring. So I'm looking at two 25-year plays. Okay. So obviously the, the storage uh, business came first, did it, before the uh, before Covalt? Um, yeah, basically the, the chain of events was car parking, then general property bucket, which was everything. Then it was let's focus in on self-storage, and we'll call that storage vault. And then Anthony and the team at HQ came up with the Covalt brand going, there's a market for some very, very high quality five-star commercial workspace. Um, do, they, do, do these sites, do you have, this is a specific criteria that you need to make when you're identifying or when the team's identifying these sites. You talked about the one which is in Cook Street, which is, I think that's Tradeston, isn't it, across the Kingston Bridge? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's only that's the only office building that we've got per se. All right, but the other ones that are popping up all over the place, like how do you wish? What's your kind of target market? Is what I'm trying to get at, and kind of who are you accommodating to? Who's your client base? To be honest, it it 
it's so wide. I mean, we've got people who do a whole range of things, but there's always a, a 10% of any market who want the best quality at fair prices. Um, and if you look at, I mean, our two, flat, our two most recent kind of flagship developments are at McFarland Street in Paisley and uh, Paul Moody. I mean, these buildings are, to me, well, I think, I mean, I obviously love them, but I just think they're really iconic, cutting edge design buildings. They've got great color schemes. They've got great branding. Are these new builds? Yeah, they're all brand, they're brand new. And these these are ground up developments. And and basically, you know, it's the branding, it's the visibility. So we, we don't really do secondary locations. Every site we do has to be high visibility main road. And that's why when you drive about, you know, if you, I mean, if you get on the M74 at Canvas Lang, you probably pass four buildings on the way into the city centre. So so the people are looking for convenience, like, you know, parking. They're not really looking for, you know, close to, like, the train station, the city centre and stuff like that necessarily, Ali. Because that one you mentioned, Paisley, I seen, seen it the other day passing by. I was like, mm, that's interesting, that's smart. You know, like, it's not really, like, in the town centre, but you can imagine how it's so easy to kind of just pull off the motorway and just park that's up. Its, that's its biggest advantage. It's, it's, on, a, it's on one of the main, main arterial routes into, into Paisley. Mm -hmm. Junction 29 is... You know, 30 seconds away, you've got the airport nearby, you've just got a whole range of connectivity. Paul Medee's on the M70, M74 is one of the busiest roads in, in Europe. Uh, Canvas Lang, I think, is about seven or eight acres. I mean, that's just a that's a that's what I call a mega campus. You know, there's a whole variety of buildings on that site. And how is that trend going then? Because obviously, like we talked, I don't want to dwell on COVID and all the rest of it because it just seems like you know we can we're moving on now we're trying to get a bit of positivity about this and stuff like that but obviously you know we saw that, that huge shift from these big companies that had you know these massive city centre offices and stuff and then people are looking at working from home so that was the kind of latest phenomena during that period and then how did you transition uh, out of that was that a huge opportunity for you guys then um, and talk a little bit about that if you can. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say we weren't affected because obviously everyone was affected, but because we were never in that, we've never been in the city centre office market and we've never been in city centre retail. We've been very, very specific for 30 years on the types of sites and the types of properties that we, that we buy and that hasn't changed. You know, we want, I mean, an agent phones me and says, you know, tell me what kind of sites you're looking for. Well, it's dead easy. Just ask yourself one question. Would a petrol station work there in principle? Uh, and that just really means main road, high visibility, high traffic flow. Um, you want to be in a, a decent population area, usually 50,000 and above. And chances are they're across Scotland, because there's been a lack of new build for the last 10 to 15, 20 years, there's actually a lack of really good high quality properties. I mean, I'll give an example. When we were building McFarland Street in Paisley, I think we had more than half those units pre-let before the cladding was even on the building because people were driving past and going, this is an amazing location. I think Paul Moody was all pre-let bar one unit before we even cut the ribbon to open it. So it's the what's it, driving the demand then? Like, is there a shift? I mean, there's, a, there's, there's a lack of quality. I mean, if you look at a lot of the buildings that were built in the 60s and the 70s, a lot of landlords won't even give them a coat of paint. You know, the, the yard's broken up. I mean, there's just there's a lack of five-star commercial property out there. And if somebody actually puts the, the impetus in to go and build it, people want it. And talk to us a wee bit about obviously scaling up now, you know, building out multiple development sites. Does that become easier once you have, you know, I mean, you see, for example, an, up, um, an example might be like Starbucks as well, the drive throughs they're all exactly the same, aren't they? All the buildings yeah. have got exactly the same materials. You know, they, imagine as you scale up something like this, it becomes easier just to roll them out. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, Anthony, our group MD, he that's that's his complete uh, domain. But, you know, we, we've got the same main contractor we've used for nearly 20 years now. 
We use the same micro red cladding on all of our buildings. We've got a couple of ballpark designs that we use. And, you know, we're very opportunistic in that we can look at any site and we've got three or four like Meccano buildings in Princeton, you can go, if we put that one and that one together, that works, that one and that one together, it works. But we, we do everything in-house. I think the key to, the key to if you can, you want to do everything in-house. And I appreciate not everybody can do that. And it's taken us 30 years to get to this, the, the point where we can. But we can literally look at any piece of ground and on a same-day basis, we can come up with an indicative design and know what we would think about doing with it. And and obviously, like like the people that listen to our podcast, right? A lot of them have got buy to let residential portfolios, and things are just not exciting them anymore with interest rates and all that, and you know the cash flow figures and stuff like that. And then you've got people like Jerry Alexander coming along, who runs a course, you know, pretty much telling you how to do this kind of CMO strategy and stuff. And it you know appeals to me as well because I've got at the moment a lettings business that I need an office for. I would like to invest in something bricks and mortar, like you say, build the asset rather than just rent the place, right? For me, it would be, I would contain an office space within that and then sublet the other ones, basic model. But do you see any challenges for people that are operating at a very small scale where they're just buying one old building and basically subdividing it up and stuff like that at a, a small level? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things. Um, I know Jerry very well. He's a good friend of mine. I've known Jerry for about 20 years. And I would honestly recommend that people listen to what he says because he's he's far closer to the day-to-day -day challenges than I am. But I can tell you one thing. If you, if you just go out and buy a building like you just described and you've got four or five units, what makes you different to everyone else who's doing it? I think we're in, we're in an era of specialization and what i would hope the team at hq have done is we've got a lot of buildings we don't put the cobalt brand on it because it doesn't tick all the boxes the quality isn't there now every building we own we've got a we've got a pretty big building land bank of of things we haven't touched i mean these are i've got properties that i bought 10 years ago 20 years ago they're rented out at good average rentals and we've got these things on a list and we go, yeah, at some point, we're going to give that the Covalt makeover. Uh, and that'll be brand new cladding, you know, new everything. Uh, we just haven't got to them yet. So if you're in the if, if you're in the Me Too sector, what makes you different? Why would I rent an office from you with an average three-star property to the guy down the road? And what you end up doing is you compete on price. Who's going to give you the biggest rent-free period? Who's going to give you this? Who's going to give you that? And the thing that I hate about the WeWork model is it was going after, no offence to Instagrammers, but it was going after the what I would call the Instagram crew. So you spend all this money doing your WeWork comp competitive building in Glasgow or Edinburgh or wherever, and you say, oh, we're going to do cheese and wine Thursdays. Somebody opens up next door and says, well, we're going to do free happy hour of beers three days a week. And then someone says, well, we'll do that five days a week. All that's happening is your margin is getting eroded day by day because these people are transient. They'll move for 50 pence, right? And all that happens that's is your margin gets eroded and eroded and eroded. Where's the specialization? Where's the brand values? And I'm not saying that anybody rents a building just because it's got a brand on it. But if you rent a Covalt building, you know what you're getting. Well, that's the other risk about doing this at a small level. So say I bought a building beside Glasgow Airport, for example, and I had four or five spaces, you know, and obviously it probably wouldn't be up to five star spec because, you know, I've not got the funds and capital there and, you know, the power that you do. So, you know, I get all these units let, small businesses, et cetera, everyone's going great. And then you come along with Covalt, build a brand new building, everyone's all singing and dancing, five star, like you say, and obviously you need to look at the price point, but people are just going to say, well, that's a much better facility. And then you're going to be left struggling to let your units possibly as well. So there definitely is a risk there, especially the, the, the rate that you're expanding at, John. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think, in all honesty, the, the, the risk is far higher at the, at the lower end of the scale, for sure. Mm. Um, because you're probably, you know, you've got bank funding, you've got other people to commit to and stuff. And, you know, I mean... The big caveat I would say is 
it ain't all as rosy as it seems. No matter what industry you're in, no matter what subsector of an industry you're in, it ain't as easy as it looks. I mean, we we actually tried to create with with Koval, we actually tried to create a new category in the market because if you look at commercial property, you look at warehousing, you look at micro warehousing, and we thought, who is actually doing branded micro spaces? And by micro spaces, I mean five hundred square feet to a couple of thousand. And you know, there used to be a couple of companies did it. They don't seem to be building any new stuff anymore. You think, right, there's nobody in this space. So we can create a new subcategory or extend a subcategory that no one else has been doing for a while. Mm. You're the only game in town. But just yeah. a wee quick question on that, John, on uh, thinking bigger then, as Nick's mentioning, the people that are maybe starting off a little bit smaller and starting off one building, what what can they, what tips would you get, give to people that are thinking bigger to go go bigger with these with these ambitious projects and, and get scale into their, their property investment business? I think, in all honesty, you should proceed with extreme caution because the worst thing you can do is is overexpand. What we were discussing a while earlier: cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Never forget, cash is king. You run out of cash, the bank takes the property off you. Your business partners or investors will take the property off you. So you've always got to be ruthlessly focused on cash flow, cash management, and and also what what scope does that give you to do what you want to do. You know, if you if you're looking at a town or a city, and there's fifty buildings or offices for rent, what are you going to do to stand out and be different that doesn't erode your margins away because that eats up your cash? You know, it, it's our it's the team at HQ make it look really really easy, but I can assure you, and I can assure every one of your listeners, it ain't easy. There's a hundred things happen every day that don't even get to my desk. And yeah. it's just this constant three-dimensional chess going on in the background. So, you know, and Jerry Alexander will tell you the same thing, right? There's a hundred different things happen on a weekly basis. Yeah, I mean, to be fair to Jer- Jerry, he doesn't, he's not one of those guys that sells the dream. Do you know what I mean? He is quite honest. And we've had him on the podcast a few times, you know what I mean? And he will talk yeah. about the challenges as well. So, yeah, absolute respect there. Um, so talk about, obviously, you know, you say yourself on previous interviews that I've listened to, you know, you find it very hard to kind of switch off as well. And you've said about always checking your emails and stuff like that. But, you know, how do how do you kind of like uh, switch off and what, what have you, you know, the point that you're at today, obviously you're in Monaco and all that. Was that a, a, a decision that you always had an ambition to get to a certain life lifestyle where you know you could run the business from anywhere and stuff like that. Talk to about where you are now. I just I really enjoy working, right? And it's one of those things um, when you've done a couple of exits, which we have done. I mean, we house builders and things bought some sites off us in the past years and years ago, and you never planned for it, but it was a very nice capital receipt to get. And I actually find the more freedom you have, the less you use it. So I always, you know, I always joke with somebody and say, you know. I could wake up tomorrow morning and just cancel the rest of the month and jump on a plane and go anywhere in the world. I've never done that in 30 years. But it's knowing that you can do it, which is the freedom. You know, I mean, I still book my EasyJet flights a year in advance because I get the cheapest price. Aye, it's it's instilled in you. Um, And I, I kind of, literally, I do my diary like 12 months out. Now, you can change anything, but I just plan it out and say, I'm going to go to Glasgow for a week. Uh, I've got an office in Isle of Man. We go to Isle of Man for a week. We're going to go to the, the storage conference in Vegas, the workspace conference in Singapore, or whatever it might be. Um, but I mean, I, I, with technology now, I mean, we're doing this podcast in three different locations uh, on Zoom. I've done to two Zoom calls this morning. You know, normally that would be fly to London, then fly here, fly there, and you spend all your time traveling. So technology now... You know, you can do a hell of a lot more than you could do even five years ago. So, so what do you do to relax then, John? What do you, what what's your biggest purpose and uh, for enjoyment? Of? The only time I ever switch off is when I'm on a ski holiday. Um, because when you're at you know two thousand, three thousand meters, and you've got a red run that's steep and icy in front of you, you got to give it full concentration. But I mean, I, I genuinely still get as much of a buzz out of working and doing what I do as I did 30 years ago. Obviously, the transition has been the work I do today is different than than what I was doing back then. But, you know, 
how, how do you evolve through the stages of your your career that John, like from from being the guy that's driving the mini buses at four o'clock in the morning to take passengers to it to knowing that the business has grown and now you need to level yourself up and change that that what you do day to day. How how do you cope with yourself in that transition? Uh, the, the biggest transition was actually handing the reins over to other people. Um, when you're a control freak and you want to dot every I and cross every T, that was it's always the most difficult thing. But there comes a point where you just, you know, you've got to have absolute confidence. First of all, you've got to get the right people around in the team and make sure that they're motivated and, and rewarded. And you've got to look at that and say, right, they actually know the answer more than I do. That's a critical point there. Motivated and rewarded. There's no point in going out there and paying minimum wage. That's you know you're not going to expect to get people who are going to deliver you know a, a good a good job and build a good team there uh, for sure. So yeah, like, incentivize. That's, that's, that's that is the biggest challenge is you know in any business getting. I mean, it's the number one challenge is finding the right the right team. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people who found businesses are scared to bring people in who know more than they do. Mm. Everybody to know more than I do. Why do you think that is? Because they're morons, they're idiots. I think that there's got to be a huge mindset shift there, handing the reins over and just going, well, do you know what? There may well be a fuck up. They might, they might well make a mistake. But unless you do that, there's no. Like, I'm at the point now where like I've got a very small lettings business, but I'm fully hands on. I'm jumping in there and putting out fires left, right, and centre. But I'm actually getting in the way of the staff who are actually trying to do it. And there'll be somebody, there'll be somebody out there who's ten times better at it than you. And if you would just stay out the road, you'll find the business would run better. Now you need the KPIs and the controls and everything in place. Okay. Um, but uh, you know you, you've. It gets to the point where you got to you got to differentiate between who's working on the business and who's working in the business, yeah. and it's challenging to try and do both. Yeah, that's good. Um, just wrapping up, John. I think I, th I think the 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 chat's been fantastic. I've really loved it, and the listeners will get a huge amount of value. Um, so just give us a wee insight into you know what does the next kind of uh, you know, 10 years or something like that, look for you, you're just going to continue letting the team do their thing and it keep expanding and you're just going to overlook things or? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still I'm still reasonably involved with the team. I'll tell you, I'm far too involved. Um, but, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at product development, putting yourself in the customer's shoes. We're looking at the, you know, in particular, the Covalt business going, what else can we do with that? Because, I you know, I'm a bit biased. I think I love that one the most because it's one that I had nothing to do with it, didn't create it. But, you know, I, I do a lot of other things outside of outside of the core property stuff as well. I've got a few friends around the world I, I do some co-investing with. Um, you know, we did some lithium mines in Arizona. The most exciting one just now is Alba Bank. We were invited, uh, Jim McCall phoned up to invite us to be one of the, the founding investors in, in Alba Bank, which is, you know, it's the first new bank in Scotland in 300 years. Oh. So that that's a really exciting one as well. Not actually that involved in it. So don't anybody phone me for loans or anything because... I was uh, going to say, <laughs> hey, do you do, I, is, I, that, I, is that funding I, for I businesses? No, or? I have no executive responsibility whatsoever. I'm merely a shareholder and there's a, an amazing management team that run running that business and building it. So hopefully Alba will be going live in the very near future. And, uh, you know, we, we really want that to be Scotland's number one business bank. For business, specialising for yeah. business. Yeah. Okay. That's Good, exciting. Yeah. And I've heard you talk quickly about... Um, you know, obviously renewables and stuff like that as well. So you yeah, you're in that um, sector as well. Yeah, we're doing that, and you know, the, we've started putting renewables into all of our sites as well. Uh, the, the, we, Anthony and the HQ team have got a a rolling program for for putting renewables onto all of our sites. You know, so yeah, it's exciting times. What, what's your problem with heat pumps? What's your right with heat pumps? Are you um, heat pump or no heat pumps? Um, <laughs> I know nothing about heat pumps, but if I'm if I've got the choice of taking the advice of Patrick Harvey or of my good friend Lord Hockey, who has sold more heat pumps, I think, than anyone else in Britain, if not the world, my money's on backing the good lord. 
Uh, we're trying to get Willie on the podcast, actually. I've tried to reach out, but obviously he's a hard man to get hold of. Uh, but yeah. That's why we're so he, appreciative to you. He, to he, knows, he knows more about this subject than I will ever know. So if Willie says they're not a good idea and they don't work, take it from me, they're not a good idea and they I, don't I, and he's great at challenging the politicians as well, so that's why we need to get him on. Well, um, do what you should do. My advice to you would be, you know, it's on every Sunday morning, the Go Radio Business Show, so I, get a call in for the board you can't afford, and then you can I, ask your question and uh, get your pitch in to come on your podcast. That's it. I'm a regular listener to that one. It's, a, it's definitely a good one. I'd well recommend it to all our, our listeners as well, with uh, Tom as well, Tom Hunter. Absolutely. It's a great show. I mean, I've listened to it every Sunday morning. It's good. Excellent. Okay, well, we'll let you go and enjoy your uh, the rest of your day. You've got a few other meetings lined up today. Um, so just drop our name in, uh, Duncan, when you see him as well. I will do. I'll pass on your best regards. Um, thanks for inviting me on, guys. Thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, hope all your listeners get some some nuggets out of there. Brilliant. Brilliant, John. Thank you very much. Thank really you, appreciate John. It. All the Take best. Care. Cheers.